In this lesson, we shall focus on MAT 2615 calculus in higher dimensions, also called multi-variable calculus. We shall actually have an overview of the kinds of things that you need to know from the beginning to the end, the A to Z um, aspects of this module are uh, the things and aspects we shall discuss today and we're getting started. Right, first things first, uh, we shall look at question one. Let L be the line in R3 that passes through the points one minus one and minus two and two minus one and one. Let V1 be the plane defined by this. So we have actually um, a plane whose equation has been given to us. And the first question says, find an equation for L. Right, so we need to find an equation for the line. Now, obviously, okay, ma okay. obviously what you need to look at here, what? we have been told that L is the line in alter that passes through the points. So you have two points there. And therefore, what we need to note is the following. Right. So given two points on, on the on the line, we need to know that um a vector. Right. So we know that a vector. Okay. Right. A vector um that is a uh, that is parallel, parallel to the line is given by, okay, a vector that is parallel to the line is given by, right. So at this point then, we note therefore that the vector is now, if you have this point and that, we can then say, Two minus one, one minus one minus minus two. Okay, so we subtract this. So moving from this initial point to the final point, we subtract them in this manner. So we take two minus one, one, and we subtract one minus one minus two, and therefore the result is as follows. So we have like two minus one, which is a one, and then we have minus one plus one, which gives us a zero. And then we have one uh, plus two, which gives us a three. Okay, so a vector that is parallel to the line is given by this, right? And 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 because of this, then we then say thus, right? That's uh, the equation. That's uh, the equation for L is given by is given by x y z right so obviously like we said last time um we can take any of these two um points either these or that the line passes through uh these points or it passes through minus one or one minus one <laughs> minus two Right, so plus, plus t times the vector, one, zero, three, and t itself is an element of the real numbers. Okay, so this is the answer because it said find the equation for L. Thus, the equation for L is given by that. So this answer to the first question um, to the question A is the one that we've written here. So think about it and please advise if there's a question or there's something you would like us to add or remove from this. Um, there you have uh, your turn. Um, 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 right, uh, Naledi. Any any idea? Any anything we need to remove, add, or um, any changes you'd like us to make? So any question? Um, I'm still copying the answer on my okay. book. Okay, right, that's fine. But also note that this is recorded, so I'll send you the video. Um, so you'll have the video um of this lesson, um, you know, after this, and you can watch anytime. Um, so yeah, 
that's something that um, you can note. Um, so, right, you're done copying. Uh, let me know, please. Right? Yes, no? <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm still busy. Okay, that's fine. All right, thanks. So let me know, please, when you're done copying. All right, let me know, please, when you're done copying. Uh, this discussion is an overview of the whole module. So today's discussion is like everything you need to know about the module. And then there are discussions we can have, which will be like on specific sections um, as well, in-depth discussions or specific sections. So now we note that obviously um, this is what we have. This is what we have. So vector that is parallel to the line is given by this because it's a line that passes through the points. And therefore, if you have a line passing through the points, then um, you have that a vector that is parallel to the line is given by the difference. Okay, also, I mean, here, you can actually take this minus that or this minus that. So the order does not matter or of subtraction of the two vectors because both vectors, this and that, are vectors on the line L. Okay, and, and also simultaneously, we said that um, also this equation of the line is defined as uh, the vector x, y, z, arbitrary vector equals the um, a point through which the line passes. So it can be one minus one minus two, or here, here, we can put two minus one, one. You know, we can actually do that. Okay, please let me know when you're done. Okay. Um, so I'm done. Okay, thank you so much. Let's move to the next question. Right, the next we're going to look at part B. Find an equation for the plane V2 that contains the line L and is perpendicular to V1. Right, so a couple of things, therefore, remain very important to say how do we then find an equation for the plane V2 that contains the line L? and is perpendicular to V1. So let's start. Uh, this is how we're going to present a solution to this. So we note that a normal, right, a normal vector, right, so we note that a normal vector perpendicular, perpendicular, to the to the plane to the plane v1 is 1 1 minus 3 so i think a normal vector perpendicular to the plane v1 so i mean we have v1 as a plane um whose equation is this so the coefficients here are 1 1 minus 3 so uh, and these coefficients constitute what you call a normal to the plane. So a normal vector perpendicular to the plane V1. Here is the plane and you have a normal. Right. And this normal that is the perpendicular to the plane uh, is a normal that um, is uh, indeed um, on the plane, but obviously perpendicular to the plane like so. And it is um, the vector 1, 1, minus 3. Just the coefficient. Coefficient of x is 1. That of y is 1. The coefficient of z is a minus 3. Okay, right. So full stop. And we shall continue to say since. Since v2 is perpendicular. Since v2 is perpendicular to V1, the vector, the vector 1, 1, minus 3 is parallel, is parallel to V2, and um, V2 contains the line the line L. 
therefore, therefore the therefore the vector the vector one zero three is also parallel. Parallel to Z2. The vector. Um, right. Okay, let's say here. Then a vector. Then a vector. Perpendicular perpendicular to V two is okay. Let us uh, let us uh, analyze this together. So we're saying that a normal vector perpendicular to the plane V one is this. So obviously V one has uh, this plane. So let V one be the plane defined by this. So V one is a plane defined by this. Defined by this, but the normal to the plane v1 or a normal to this is uh, 1 1 minus 3. since v2 is perpendicular to v1 because here they said find an equation for the plane v2 that contains the line l and is perpendicular to v1 so we are noting that the plane v2 is perpendicular to v1 so in other words if you have uh, the two planes you have the plane v2 and then you have the plane v1 so these two planes are perpendicular to, to each other. But we are saying find an equation for the plane V2 that contains the line L. So we note that the line L is the line that is uh, um, actually on the plane V2 and is perpendicular to V1. Okay, good. Good. This is what we have. So we note therefore here that a normal vector perpendicular to the plane v1 is uh, 1 1 minus 3 since v2 is perpendicular to v1 yes v2 perpendicular to v1 the vector 1 1 minus 3 is parallel to v2 okay this is good news because we're able to see that to v2 there is the normal and, and the normal is the vector 1 1 minus 3 okay so there is a vector 1, 1, minus 3. It is always given a plane. If this is the equation of, uh, of the plane, then the vector formed by the coefficient of x, of y, of z, uh, these coefficients constitute what you call um, a normal vector perpendicular to the plane. So, yeah. Right, so it's perpendicular to v1. Note that it is perpendicular to v1 so let v1 be the plane defined by this so in other words you can get a normal to it so perpendicular to v1 is is the is the vector 1 1 minus 3 1 1 so perpendicular to v1 here is v1 perpendicular to v1 is that so we are then saying a normal vector perpendicular to the plane v1 is 1 1 minus 3 since v2 is perpendicular to v1 okay we can see that v2 is perpendicular to v1 the vector 1 1 minus 3 is parallel to v2 okay we can see this vector it is parallel to v2 okay that's what this is saying here right so it's parallel to v2 and v2 contains the line l we know that v2 contains the line l according to the description there Okay, right. Therefore, the vector 1, 0, 3 is also parallel to V2. Okay, we found the vector 1, 0, 3 in the previous question and uh, formed by these two vectors. And therefore, the vector 1, 0, 3 is a vector that is also um, parallel. Right, so it's parallel to V2. Then a vector perpendicular to V2 is. So we need a vector per per perpendicular to V2. And I want us to look at these, but look at these very carefully here. And think together. Once again, you have, and I want to use the same sketch here. So if there's V2, V1, and L, there's V2, V1, and then L. Okay, there's, yeah, plane V2, 
plane V1 and they're perpendicular to each other. And then there is, we have the line L here. Okay. And so we have noted that the one, one minus three, let V1 be the plane defined by this. So if V1 is, is defined by that, it means that we have a normal to it, a normal to V1 is this one, one, one minus three. So we can be able to get a normal here. Why? Why do we even are we interested in this? Because to find an equation for the plane, we, we need a normal always. We need a normal. Um, and, uh, and obviously we also need um, a point on the plane. Okay, right. So yeah, we'll refer to the formula. We'll refer to the formula we used last time. So yeah, we have uh, V1 and V1 is a plane, V1, and it is a normal, uh, 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 which is a perpendicular vector to V1, which is one, one minus three. We need to then find an equation for the plane V2. That contains, so yeah, to find an equation for V2, we need a couple of things. So here we need, there is a vector. A vector parallel to the line is the vector 1, 0, 3. We remember the vector 1, 0, 3, which is formed by this one minus that. Okay, this vector minus that. So we already know the vector 1, 0, 3. We got it in the previous question. It is parallel to the line. So, oh, now this is interesting. So we actually, therefore, are able to see, we therefore have two vectors, two vectors. The vector one, one, uh, minus three, and the vector one, zero, three, which is I, J, K, and then we have one, one, minus three, one, zero, three, Okay, now these two vectors, a vector on the line, parallel to the line, this one, zero, three, and, and this one are in the same direction. So these two vectors are um, actually parallel to each other. But now if we, they are parallel to the plane, they are parallel to the plane V2. But now if we find a vector cross product of the two vectors, then you'll be able to get the a normal to V2. Okay, once again, this is recorded. So yeah, you should not worry much about copying yet because we shall be cruising, 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 right? We block first column and first row, and then it's going to be one by three, which is actually three, and then plus zero. Okay, because it is one by three, then minus this, which is going to be zero, minus j. You need vector j, and you block this, and that is one by three is three plus three. Okay, because if you block the first row and, first, and, and the second column, you have one by three, which is actually three plus this. Okay. Plus the unit vector k, block this first row and this column, and we have one by zero, which is zero minus one. Zero minus one. So three unit vector i, six unit vector j, and you have k. Obviously, this is the this one here, because you, we took two vectors that were parallel to the plane. One zero three parallel to plane v2, one one three parallel to plane v2. We have here this one written in terms of, of the unit vectors can be written like this, like so. <laughs> yes, like so. Okay, and this guy here is the normal. Um, so is the normal to um is the normal to um to v two, okay, um and and thus. Okay, once again, yeah, don't worry much about copying. There are lots of questions we're going to do, and everything is recorded. So that's the 3 minus 6 minus 1 um, is a normal, is a normal to plane, or to the plane, to the plane V2. It is a normal to the plane V2. Now, what then do we have here? Well, now, now, the equation, right, now the equation for the plane, for the plane V2, Um, it becomes 
Okay, we can say that now the the equation for the plane is given by. Okay, is given by. Is given by this formula x arbitrary vector x normal equals point times normal. Okay, and I know we can use this formula or we can use this one. A x minus x one, B y minus y one, C z minus z one equals zero. So yeah, to find the equation of a plane, we can use the top one or the bottom one. Okay, we are spoiled for choice, and uh, we make mention of the fact that this is the case where where z Normal three we got here three minus six minus one three minus six minus one and choosing and choosing point P right and you can choose point P you can choose this one. 1 minus 1 minus 2. 1 minus 1 minus 2. The point. Um, a point on the plane. A point on the plane. At this point, this means what? At this point, this means that we have uh, the following here. We then have that. Um, if we have, we use the formula vector x in for the normal point times the normal. We have uh, the x. x is x, y, z. The normal is 3 minus 6 minus 1. Is uh, actually 3 minus 6 minus 1. The point, we chose 1 minus 1 minus 2. Dot the normal, which is 3 minus 6 minus 1. We dot these things. Find the dot product. x by 3. 3x. Three y and minus 6. Minus 6y. Minus z equals 1 by 3, which is 3. Minus 1 by minus 6 is actually a 6. Minus 2 and minus 1 is actually a 2, so that we have 3x minus 6y minus z equals. So this is actually uh, equal to 11. And uh, this is the equation of the, of the normal. Right, so is there other equation for the plane V2? Um, and because that's what the, that was the question, find an equation for the plane V2. So this one is the, the equation for, yeah, is the equation for the plane, for the plane V2. Right. Um, for the plane V2, that contains that contains the line L, the line L, and is perpendicular, perpendicular to V1. Okay, so yeah, this is the answer to question 3x minus 3y, uh, 3x minus 6y minus z equals 11. Okay, yeah, ju just to take note of that. But uh, also this can be written as 3x minus 6y minus z uh, minus 11 equals 0. So the 11 can also be transposed to the left-hand side of the equation. In which case, if it becomes 3x minus 6y minus z minus 11 equals 0. Let's look at the next question. Right, next we focus on, yeah, once again, these things are being recorded. So yeah, you'll have a chance 
day night with a video. I'm going to send the end of our discussion. You can watch and replay and whatnot. Determine whether the following limits exist, either by giving a proof from first principles or considering limits along curves. Right, we shall look at this limit here and uh, look at how this is done. So, first things first, we, fo we focus on the first question. And now, to actually... Um, Determine whether the following limit exists, uh, limits exist, so either by giving a proof uh, from first principles or considering uh, limits along curves. So, but obviously, this one is our old friend from Calculus 1. And we know that to do the first question, we say, from what you call L'Hopital's rule. From L'Hopital's rule. We know that the limit as z tends to 0 of sine z over z equals 1. Okay, we know from L'Hopital's rule that this is 1. With this in mind, we let z be x plus i, y. So you can take this guy and make it the x plus y and make it x plus i, y. Now, for every For every epsilon positive, there exists, there exists a delta positive such that if, yes, please. Um, so I didn't explain why we jump straight to L'Hopital's rule. Okay, okay, that's that's fine. All right, now obviously the reason why we're jumping straight to L'Hopital's rule, um, is because of the nature of the limit. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we use L'Hopital rule when the limit itself does not uh, exist. So we're able to see that if you have the limit of sine z over z as z approaches zero you would have sine 0 over 0. If you take the limit straight away, and what is sine 0, which is 0 over 0? And 0 over 0 is what you call is indeterminate. Right, it's indeterminate. Right, because it is indeterminate, or what you call an indeterminate form, right, and uh, 0 out, out of 0 is undefined, indeterminate, and therefore we actually obviously had to use optimal rule to evaluate the limit. Okay, and obviously that is a, a very popular result in first year calculus, calculus one. Excuse me. So now, obviously, that's the reason why we use L'Hopital rule there. Okay, but yeah, this once again is recorded, so you'll have the access to these um, whenever you need this uh, video to see exactly what happened here. Okay, now let us uh, continue to analyze this. Now, we then come to this a particular limit and then the function of the limit. And we then say, let the x plus y be z. So let z to be x plus y. Now for every epsilon positive, there exists a delta positive. Okay. Such that if, okay, this statement is a, it's, it's, it's a very, very popular statement in calculus, such that if, okay, let me write here. Let's write this one here. Such that if zero, is less than um less than the modulus of z less than delta then then we know that the modulus of um, this um function right which is the sine of x plus y divided by x plus y this minus 1 is less than epsilon. Okay. Because we just take this one, because we know this limit is one, and then, then we can just take this function minus the limit, which is one, and it's less than epsilon. Now, for every epsilon positive, there exists a delta positive, such that if this is the case, then that is the case. The objective here becomes to find delta that depends on epsilon. Right, so we proceed as follows. And we're able to note then 
the modulus of x plus y, which is going to emerge in the denominator, is uh, less or equal to the modulus of x, the modulus of y, by the triangle inequality. By the triangle inequality. By the triangle inequality. Okay. Hence, hence, if you have x plus y modulus, it's going to be less or equal to the modulus of x and that of y. And uh, what is this exactly? What is this precisely? We can therefore be in a position to note that at this point, this is less or equal to the modulus of x and that of y, and this is equal to this modulus and this. Okay. Now, note this as a matter of fact. So the modulus of x is less or equal to the length of x and y. And the modulus of y is less or equal to that as well. So in principle, this is the case here. This becomes the case there. So these are, yeah, I want to uh, sort of explain this because it's very basic, yet uh, obviously students can miss this out. I'm going to do it in green. So, I mean, first and foremost, we know that if you have the length, the, in mathematics, the modulus of x or the absolute value of x is, is the square root of x squared. Okay, the square root of x squared is equal to this by definition. Okay, so, but now we can increase the size of the right-hand side. And wherever there is x squared, we can include a y squared. But now if you include the y squared, because the y squared is greater or equal to zero, so this right-hand side is going to be bigger than the left. Now, this, therefore, is this. And, and that is the reason why here, wherever now you think the modulus of x is less or equal to um, the length of x and y, but also the modulus of y is less or equal to the length of x and y. Okay, so um, in a nutshell, what we're also effectively saying is if you have the modulus of y, it is actually exactly this. It is the square root of y squared. Okay, this is square root of y squared. But this, we can increase the right-hand side, in which case, therefore, you can have, we can put x squared. By Pythagoras' theorem, the square root of x squared plus y squared is is, is is like the radius. Okay, this is like the radius. Because if you have uh, a position vector, you have two um, coordinates like that. Therefore, this is a y and that's an x. And therefore, now you can be able to find the length. And the length of this is the by, by, by Pythagoras theorem. Okay, if you have the length of x and y, it is actually the square root of x squared plus plus y squared. It is the square root of x squared plus plus y squared. So that's something that uh, you need to um, note that it is actually the square root of x squared plus y squared. Note that. Okay x squared plus y squared square root is the length of the hypotenuse. This is Pythagoras theorem and yeah, something we very, very familiar with. Now let's continue. Let's continue. Okay, if you add this to that, it is twice x and y. It is twice x and y. 
Right, so. Now, since. Since zero is less or equal to the length of x and y minus zero, zero. So we're dealing with, we're dealing with the bottom of this. So we're taking this x, y vector and we are minusing the zero and zero. So since this year, we can take it to be delta out of two. Because uh, delta out of 2 itself is less than delta. Then 0 is less than x plus y, less than delta. Less than delta. OK. And remember, we're still doing part A. And uh, the modulus of the sine of x plus y divided by x plus y, it was minus, it was uh, minus 1. It is minus 1. And this is less than epsilon. Then we have... Then we have proved from first principles that then we have proved from first principles that the limit as x and y approach 0 and 0 of the side of x plus y out of x plus y this limit equals 1. We have proven that this limit equals 1. All right, so since this is less than delta of 2, then this one is going to be less than delta because it has both x and y. It has both x and y. So um, then 0 less than x plus y less than delta. And uh, this absolute value or the modulus of the side x plus y over x plus y minus 1 is less than epsilon. Then we have uh, proved from first principles that this limit is 1. Okay. Okay. This is uh, there. And uh, think about it. Let's do the next question. Yes, please. Um, I, I don't understand why you only dealt with the bottom part and never touched the upper part, like the sine x, I mean, sine open bracket x plus y. Like you only dealt with the lower part. Yes, we dealt with the uh, bottom part. Yeah, I get your point that it appears as if we dealt mostly with the x plus y. And the reason why we dealt with the x plus y um, it's because simultaneously the sine of x plus y also is a function of x plus y. But moreover, it is because of the fact that our delta itself, delta lies between, or yes, we have that the modulus of z, and z is x plus y. So we have that from the onset of the problem. Um, the absolute value of x plus y lies between zero and delta. So yeah, we said, if zero is less than the absolute value of z less than delta. So in other words, the z is x plus y. So that now you have that the modulus of x plus y is actually what we need to mostly focus on. And that is what we need to ultimately achieve. Because at this point, we're able to realize that since this, uh, by definition, the vector x and y minus zero, zero, is to be less than delta of a t, ultimately less than delta, then we have that this is less than delta. Okay, and, and that is because of the onset of the statement. And we said that for every epsilon positive, there exists a delta such that 
um, a focus on the because we have uh, the bottom here, a focus on the on the bottom on the act vector x and y um, minus zero and zero less than delta would imply that this is less than epsilon. Okay, think about it. I'm sure that we can always have more time to discuss this proof. Okay, think about it. You can always have more time to discuss this proof. Now, next point. Now, the next one is very, very simple. But now, does it exist? Does it not exist? Well, it does not exist straight away. But yeah, we'll prove that. Determine whether the following limits exist either by giving a proof from first principles. The first one exists because of the L'Hopital rule argument. And because it exists from first year, we proved it using epsilon delta. We gave a proof from first principles. But now this one does not exist. Okay, just looking at it, but we're going to show now that it does not exist. And then we shall use the limits along curves. So we do to do part uh, uh, B, we let C be the curve. Right, so it is a relevant curve. Be the curve Y equals X. And so there is D. the curve y equals 2x okay we take two two curves here they're enough um um they're enough to help us prove this so uh, thus with the limit x y approaches zero and zero Okay, we're taking it from here. And um, this is the limit. Okay, now we're going to take it along along curve C, which is this one. But if you take it along curve C, it means therefore um, wherever there is a Y, you can put X. So that now we have the modulus of X. Y is the modulus of X. Okay. Okay, yeah. You can even remove the C here. Because at this point, what we have here is X and Y. Uh, okay, uh, they, they actually approach zero and zero. Uh, so that here we have X and X. And then because it's X and X, then you can say, you can consider one X approaches that. And this, so because it's the limit of a constant, then it is the constant of the limit. So it is just one there. Next. And uh, we also have the limit. Now we're going to take along curve D. Zero and zero. X, Y. Limit. Okay, this one now is... You can put here x, and we called d to be 2x. So wherever it is y, we put 2x. But this approach is 0 and 0. Modulus x, 2x. OK. Right, because it's x approaches 0, 2x approaches 0, it means it's the limit as x approaches 0. Modulus of x, 2x. OK. So we have two x here. Okay, yeah, what is this? This is the limit. X approaches zero. Okay, x approaches zero. Okay, modulus of x, modulus of two, modulus of x. Modulus of x cancels, giving us the limit. As x approaches zero of one half and this is one half okay we have one limit is one the other limit is one half so because these are different therefore it means the limit does not exist now we go on to say since the limit as x and y approaches zero and zero along curve c of this function 
this is not equal to the limit along curve C is not equal to the limit along curve D. Okay, and of the function. Okay, this limit along curve C is not equal to the limit along curve D. The limit does not exist. The limit does not exist. The limit does not exist. Okay, yeah, so this was nice and easy and short because it does not exist. Um, and this is the proof. So determine whether the following uh, exists either by giving a proof from first principles or considering limits, limits along curves. We used limits along curves and we showed that the limit does not exist. I believe that is clear enough. Any question? No question, I believe. All right? No question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, okay, let's leave more space. Right, now question three, it's interesting and very easy. Consider the R2 to R function defined by this. So yeah, we have this R2 to R function given by this. Find the critical points of F in their nature. So yeah, we have a chance to discuss critical points. And to discuss the critical points, um, we proceed as follows. So we say the domain, right, the domain. The domain of F has, Boundary has boundary right. Right, the domain of F has boundary, and thus, um, there are. They are critical points. They are critical points where they are critical points where um um where the gradient where the gradient of the function is zero and zero. We compute. We compute the gradient of the function f. In the spirit of this module, we say d1 f. Okay, we can say d1 f of x and y. D2 F of X and Y. Okay, yeah, but this kind of notation is also popular, but you can also write this as FX, FY. It's the same thing. Because the D1 is a derivative with respect to X, and D2 is a derivative with respect to Y. Okay. Now let us, and this must be 0 and 0. The critical points that exist were the the gradient is zero. Okay. Now, the gradient. The gradient of fx and y is now a derivative with respect to x of the function. This one, with respect to x. So what do we get here? If you have one third x cubed, if you find the derivative of this one, is it, it is going to become x squared. This one with respect to x, is y with respect to x it's a one with respect to x zero with respect to x zero 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 with respect to y the derivative this is the partial derivative so with respect to y if y d2 x has derivative zero okay with respect to y this one is going to be x with respect to y zero derivative partial derivative, zero partial derivative. With respect to y, this one is going to be plus y. With respect to y, it's going to be seven. With respect to y, it's going to be zero. And this is zero and zero, like so. Okay, let us, let us analyze this. Let us analyze this. Now, what is this 
What is the meaning of all this? Okay, uh, the component-wise comparison, by comparison of the components of these two vectors, uh, the first component equals the first, the second equals the second. So this is able to give us two equations, x squared plus y plus one equals zero. Right, we're able to have x squared plus y plus one equals zero, but which is this one? The second one is x plus y x plus y plus 7 equals 0. Like this. Okay, now we continue. We perform some algebra. Subtracting. Subtracting equation. Equation 2 from equation 1. Gives. Okay, subtracting these two equations. So subtracting equation two from equation one, you would have x squared minus x. So the y minus y is zero, and then we have y um, one minus seven, giving us a minus six. Okay, let us quickly factorize this one. I know it's easy. Factors of x squared are x and x. And then we have minus three plus two. Upon careful examination, we have x equals 3 or x equals minus 2. Okay. This is what we do with the critical points. And so, if x, if x equals minus 2, for example, doesn't matter, we can start with x equals 3 because it's on the left here. Doesn't matter. And you can start with any of these. But if x is 3, we substitute into the original equations, these equations. And we want to get y, because these are, these are smart hands equations from high school. So, for example, if these are smart hands equations, if x is 3, we can use the simplest one which is the bottom one here. Right, so we have x plus y plus 7 is 0. x is 3, which is 3 plus y plus 7 equals 0, which means y equals, which means y equals minus 10. If x is equal to minus 2, we have x plus y plus 7 equals 0. Well, x is minus 2, so we have minus 2. We want to solve for y. These are Martinez equations. Um, therefore, we're using elimination to do this one. And then 7 minus 2 is a 5. But bring the 5 across, make, it makes it negative. So we have those. So, I mean, what is the meaning of this? Uh, well, it means that thus the critical points, the critical points are, what are they? There are two of them. Okay, when x is 3, y is minus 10. And when x is minus 2, y is minus 5. Okay. Like so. Okay, now we'll continue. What do we want? Remember, we found the critical points, but now find the critical points of f and their nature. So now we found the critical points. There are two of them, but we must just now describe their nature in terms of their central points or or, or there are minimax points, etc., etc. Okay, now let's continue to investigate the nature of these points, of these two points. So, now we then say to determine to determine the na their nature, their nature we compute. To determine their nature, we compute the determinant. 
or what you call the discriminant. Right, so we compute the discriminant. We compute the discriminant and the discriminant D, which is FXX times FYY minus the mixed partial derivative FX and Y. Okay, now let us consider the function. So we want to find the nature of the critical points we've already got. Always we use Martinez equations for the critical points. But now, here we want to find fxx with respect to x. Okay, let's find first. <laughs> it's going to be tricky. Let's find step by step. First, partial derivative with respect to x, fx alone. Bring down three. It's going to be x squared with respect to x. It's going to be y with respect to x is one with respect to x zero. You come to this one, which is 2x. Okay, these are zero with respect to x. So differential for the second time, partial derivative. Okay, now, now let's come to this same function. We're going to do fy because we need fyy in the discriminant. So first we're going to find the partial derivative with respect to y. This one is zero. With respect to y, it's only x. With respect to y, it's zero. With respect to y, this one is just y. Bring down two, subtract one from the power. With respect to y, it is just seven. And then the derivative of this one is zero. But now we find the second one. We differentiate again with respect to y. So it's just going to be one because this is zero and that is zero with respect to y. Partial differentiation. Now we continue. Fxy. Okay, there's fx. Fx is this one. Then differentiate this fx with respect to y. This is fx. It's differentiate with respect to y. So this is going to be 0, 0, and this is going to be 1. Therefore, therefore, the d which we've already said is fxx, fyy minus fxy, and fxx is 2x, fyy is 1, fxy is 1, which is 2x minus 1. Okay, we found the discriminant now. What is the discriminant? Right, hence, Hence the discriminant. Right, the discriminant is uh, D equals 2x minus 1. Okay, we found this one. But I want us to continue and find the, the and evaluate this one at the critical points. Right, we remember the critical points, we found two of them. And then we now we're just determining their nature. So the critical points we found uh, minus two, minus five, and the three, minus 10. Okay, so now we're gonna find a discriminant, evaluate discriminant at two minus five, this one. Okay, x is what? x, y. x is minus 2, which is minus uh, 4, minus 1, minus 5. Negative. So, minus 2, minus 5 is a settle. It's a settle point. Okay, it's a central point according to the classification because the discriminant is negative, this is minus five at this critical point. Now the discriminant can be evaluated, it's evaluated now at three and minus ten. Okay, let's substitute here. Okay, it is two x minus one. So two x is three, 
x, y. x is 3, minus 1. So this is exactly 6 minus 1, giving us a 5. And this 5, 5 is a, is a, is a positive number. So, 3 minus 10 is a local extremum. Is a local extremum. Okay. So being a local extremum, because now it's tricky, this one. Um, if, if the discriminant is less than zero, then it's a settle. It's a settle point. But if it is bigger than zero, then we need to investigate further. Now, we're going to evaluate this one at fxx. Now, okay, what is fxx? fxx, we know, is 2x. Okay, so fxx is 2x. We're going to be 4, just the second derivative, twice with respect to x. And then now we're going to find fxx evaluated at this point that is tricky, that is greater than 0, which is not necessarily a central point. Okay, 3 minus 10, then we're going to put 2. What is our x here? Is it 3? 6. And 6 is positive. So now, because uh, the fxx is bigger than 0, um, therefore, right, therefore, or thus, Thus, uh, this critical point, 3 minus 10, is a local minimum. Is a local minimum. Yeah, we're finishing. We're pushing. I want to cover much. Okay, it's a local. <laughs> right, I want to say it's a local minimum. It's a local minimum. All right, it is a local minimum because um, the fxx is bigger than is bigger than zero. As much as also the discriminant is bigger than zero, it becomes a local minimum. Otherwise, it becomes a um, a local maximum. Now, uh, we need to spend a bit more time on the classifications of these, okay? Because there are lots of classifications that we need to learn. And I'm yet to spend more time on this section of uh, critical points and their nature in the classifications of um, crit critical points. Okay, I want us to discuss the notion of the chain rule for determining the derivative of the function, the composition of f and r, vector r, and vector r is an is an r to r three function, and f is an r three to r uh, to r function. Okay, this is about statement, so we need to state that's that's all. So this is the statement. If if vector r is in is an r to r three function, that is that is differentiable. Is an r to r three function that is differentiable. That is differentiable at a t and and f f is in r to r three function. Is an R to R3 function. That is differentiable. At. Get R of T. Then. The composition, 
then the composition of F and R is differentiable. Is differentiable at T and And the composition of the function f with the vector r is the gradient of f r at t r prime at t. Okay. Yeah. Now, if R is an R to R3 function that is differentiable at T and F is in R to R3 function is differentiable at F, at, at, at rather at R of T. So, yeah, with F is a function that is differentiable at R of T, then the composition of the two functions F and R is differentiable at T. And uh, this is the derivative. Okay, this is called the chain rule for determining uh, for determining the derivative of the function, um, which is a composition of the two functions f and r. Okay, uh, just for two marks, they normally uh, this suffices to write in that manner. Next question is book work. Nothing strange there. Okay, I left more a bit more space for the for the chain rule. Okay, let us apply the chain rule to just find derivative of a function. Now, we have been given a, a multivariable function, a function f of three variables, x, y, and z. Okay, it is the product of x, y, and z. And the r to r3 function r is defined by this. Use the chain rule that you stated in part A to calculate now the derivative. So, yeah, I just want to use the chain rule here. Um, let us use that one. Okay. Let us use that one. But first, uh, to use that, we first find the gradient of the function. So we find the gradient. The gradient of the function x, y, z. Okay. What is uh, this? Is d1f, d2f, D3F. Okay, this is the in, in the notation of this module. D1 is derivative with respect to x of this one. With respect to x, differentiate x is 1, and we're left with y, z. D2, with respect to y, derivative of y is 1. We're left with x and z. D3, with respect to z, derivative of the z alone is 1. You're left with x, y. Okay. And... Now, this is the R, and then by the chain rule, you need to find the derivative of this one with respect to R, so um, it's going to be... Okay, but first, let us write the R as it is. Okay, and therefore, we want to now um, compute um, R primed of T. With respect to t, the derivative of e is e. e to the t is e to the t. The derivative of e to the minus t is e to the minus t, but you multiply by the derivative of the top. The derivative of the top is minus 1, making it minus e to the minus t. The derivative of the t alone, with respect to t, it's like the, it's like the derivative of x with respect to x. It's a 1. Okay. Um, now, and uh, let us find the gradient of the function f r of t. Okay, now let's look. This is the um, the gradient, but now we are replacing x, y, and z with this other triple. So this is our x, our y, and our z. Okay, we put we put them. Um, they must appear here. So 
what is our our x there? Okay, we must put y here and z. Y is e to the minus t, z is t. So this is going to be t e to the minus t. X is e to the t, z is t. T e to the t. X is e to the t, y is e to the minus t. You multiply them. You multiply this and that. Multiplying this and that, you just subtract the exponents. The pieces are the same. So it's t minus t, the top, e to the 0, gives us a 1. Now that is something you need to note. And this then allows us to say hands. Answer by the chain rule, we find the derivative of the composition of the two functions, which is the gradient um, of f r of t, r prime of t. Okay, we've already found the gradient of this f r of t. Okay, gradient of f r of t is t e to the minus t. T e to the t. One. And these are primed is what? Which is e to the t minus e to the t. Okay, just the derivative of this one. Of the r with respect to t. So this is going to be minus and the derivative of t alone. With respect to t, it's a one. Okay, component-wise multiplication, this by this, this times that, it's t. This times that is minus t. Okay, and thus, fr. Okay, yeah, so this one is one. Okay, so this is one. So yeah, use the chain rule you stated to calculate the uh, the uh, the derivative of this. Or we use the chain rule to find the derivative of these, and we found that the derivative is one. Okay, just just take note of how we use the chain rule here. Once again, I mean we have a chance. This is recorded, so yeah, you have a chance to watch this replay, 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 and so on. All right, the next thing when well, we are moving to Lagrange. Okay, you must also learn optimization. Right. Optimization. Optimization is a very important part of the of the of, of this module. So it's something you need to understand. Now, a delivery company needs the needs the measurements of a rectangular box such that the length plus twice the width plus the Height should not exceed 300 centimeters. Use the method of Lagrange. Okay, the method we're discussing is the method of Lagrange to find the maximum volume of such a box. Let's discuss the method of Lagrange. Okay, remember that we are finding the maximum volume of such a box. And this box is it's a very exciting box. Boxes. Right. Here's the box. X, Y, Z. Okay. Yeah. The length, the breadth, the height. So the height of the box is like Z. Okay. Something like that. So we will let um, let X be the length Um, y be the width and z be the height. Okay, and z be the height. Okay, like so. Now, the volume. Okay, this one is from even high school, primary school. The volume of the box. So normally there's one question that comes. Is the, what is the volume of the box? It's a function of three variables because it considers volume is area of base by height. Okay, wait a minute. 
Volume is area of base by height. So it is length by breadth by height. So it is X, Y, Z. Length by width by height. Okay. So it is exactly this one, which is length by width by height. Um, now there's something called the constraint equation. Right, there's something called the constraint equation. So we always seek to cover the constraint and that's what the examiner is saying here. They're saying a delivery company needs the measurements of a rectangular box such that the length plus twice the, the width so this is what is giving the constraint. So we call it G, X, Y, Z. So right, such that the length, right, so if you have the length and we call the length X plus twice the width, okay, the width is Y, right? So so that the length plus twice the width plus the height, height is Z, should not exceed, should not exceed 300. So it can always be 300 or, or less. And so we must, we must maximize, maximize V volume, Subject to, we must maximize the volume subject to the constraint. The constraint that G is 300. Right, so obviously, I mean, we need to find the maximum volume. Of such a box so we need to maximize but subject to the constraint that g must be 300 or less or just 300 we compute so it can't exceed 300 so we compute we compute the gradient of the volume okay then we're going to set the, the method of lagrange the gradient of the volume function Okay, yeah, this is the volume, but we want to find the gradient. So the gradient we know, we find the derivative with respect to x, and it's one, it's giving us y, z. The derivative with respect to y, this becomes one, then we're left with x, z. The derivative with respect to z is one, we're left with x, y. Okay. So we found the gradient of the volume, but according to the method of Lagrange, you must find a volume of the gradient of the function we need to optimize, which is the volume, but also we must find the gradient of the constraint function, okay? The constraint equation, which is this one. So now we're gonna find the, the gradient of, of this one. Right, so with respect to x, it is only one. With respect to y, two. With respect to z, one. Okay, so that's what we have. Then for some lambda, then this is the method of Lagrange, the formula for the method of Lagrange. Then for some lambda, right, so we then say the gradient of the volume function. For some lambda, it is equal to lambda times the gradient of the constraint equation. Okay, so this becomes the constraint equation. What is the gradient of the constraint equation? It is x, y, z. Okay, that's what we have. So what is the gradient of the volume function? It is exactly this one. It is y, z, x, z, x, y. It is y, z, x, z. It is y, z, x, z, x, y. 
lambda. The gradient of the constraint equation, okay, this, this thing here, this equation here is the most important. It's everything we need. And this is called the method, the method of Lagrange, this. Okay, now, we then say, what is the gradient of the, of the constraint equation? It is one to one, put it here. So one to one, like this. Multiply uh, by distribution, y, z, x, y, no, <laughs> x, z, x, y. Okay, so this one is x, z. x, z, and this one is x, z, then it's x, y. Okay. Okay, multiply one by um, lambda, lambda, two lambda, lambda by one, lambda. Okay, now, what is this? Therefore, Right, therefore now we can equate everything. So which means that yz equals lambda, xz is two lambda, xy is lambda. Okay, this, what is all this? Therefore, Therefore, because this one is lambda and this one is lambda, it means that x, y is y, z. x, y is y, z. Okay. And so, because uh, there's y, y, and so it means x equals z y cancels which means x equals z using the first using the first and third okay i need to just be careful here Okay, I need to select the equations that are going to work. Um, because you've already used the first and the third equations, and uh, we got x equals z because like y cancels, if you like. Uh, so giving us x equals z. Um, right, so... Let us use also this equation. Because if x equals z and you put z here, using the second, the second equation. And now you're gonna, if you put x here, uh, which is z, so you're going to have z squared is 2 lambda. You're going to have x squared is 2 lambda or z squared is 2 lambda. But also, here you can put, you can use this one because x is z. So using the second and third and third equations. Okay, using the second and third equations. What do we have? Right, so here in the place of z, you put x, giving us x squared is equal to, and here you put, so yeah, you have x squared, so you replace z by x. So you also come here, in the or there in this case you replace z by x so you can put 
y x and this will therefore the same as what okay let's analyze these together let's analyze these together because this is going to be two lambda right it's going to be exactly two lambda and Okay, I need to write this carefully. <laughs> right, so obviously this is going to be if you if if x equals z here, you'll have exactly in the place of z you put x, so it's going to be x squared equals two lambda. Let's just write that one. Right, um, to avoid uh, mix up, so you have x squared equals two lambda because x equals z. So, um, and here we replace z by x getting x squared. So we can replace z by x getting y x equals lambda. Okay, and this means x squared equals 2 lambda, which is 2 y x. And so what is this? If x squared equals 2 y x, Right, and so we can manipulate. Okay, it's, it's a 2yx. Okay. Right, so I need to write the property here, 2yx. Okay. Now here you can do anything. Pulling out x, it's x minus 2y equals zero and this means that x equals two y x is not zero so x is two y since okay what is the constraint equation it is this one okay it is g x y z equals x plus two y plus z g x y z it's x plus 2y plus z, x plus 2y plus z equals 300. x plus 2y plus z equals 300. Okay, Um. but we already have that x is 2y. Uh, since that we see that, okay, let's see, because X is 2y, so wherever there's 2y, you can put x, getting, um, wherever there's x, you can put 2y. Okay, wherever there's x, we have 2y. Okay. Uh, okay. Plus z equals 300. What else uh, do we need here? In the now, let us uh, look at this, but look at this very, very carefully and reason what this uh, means um, at this point. Okay, and obviously, I mean, what is very evident is that 4y plus z is 300. But what else do we have? You also have that, for instance, we have that x equals z. Right. We also have that x itself equals z. However, and look into that, you're able to see that that is not perhaps very, very useful. Right, so we need another constraint to use here. We need most certainly another constraint to put to use. So let us, so now we need to find another relation that is going to 
make this one variable. Because if it makes this one variable, then we're good. So we need a connection between y and z. Let's go back to the equations. So if, you, if we have these two equations, can you get a connection between y and z here? Right? A connection between y and z. For instance, if you look at the any of them, maybe the this and that. If you divide them to each other with each other, z cancels. Okay, if you look at this and that, if you divide them with each other, is the so y would cancel and then you'd have z and x. But now if you divide these two, you have y and z. Aha, uh -huh, there it is. So you can um okay. We continue. Okay. Okay, yeah. So you're good. Okay, yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we are here. <laughs> okay, I'm then saying if you look at these two, so you can take x z equals x z equals two lambda x y equals lambda. X z equals two lambda and okay, x z equals two lambda x y equals lambda. Okay. Call this equation one and call this equation two. Okay, so if you take these two equations and divide them in the following way, say one divided by two. One divided by two so that you have x z, you divide by x y is equal to two lambda over lambda. What is this? Okay, um, x is going to cancel out, giving us z over y is equal to two. You cross multiply here so that z equals two y. Okay, so. Yeah, we found one equation. You need to be cunning here a little bit sometimes to just play around with these equations. So we can say, okay, I called I already called this one two. So let's call this one. Call them three four. Call them three four. Right. So you put. You put four. Um. Yeah, it's, it's common practice to write uh, the things here. Put equation four into three, into equation three. All right, so you put equation four into equation three. Okay, so we have four y plus, what is that? Z is 2y equals 300. 6y equals 300. Okay, if we say 6y is 300, we want to get y. So you divide by 6, both left and right. And then it means y equals, okay. <laughs> right, let's divide. 600 divided by that. 600, uh, rather 300, divided by 6, we have 50. So we get y equals 50. And now let's, okay, we just multiply equations, these things here. So, but z is 2y, z is 2y equation 4. And from Equation four, z is two y, so that is two y is 50. We want to get x, y, and z, remember. Okay, two by 50 is 100. 
So Z is 100. And then now it remains to get X as well. It remains to get X as well. And so using, just check, get one of the equations. You can get anyone. But what, any equation that has X in it, okay? Any equation that has X in it. Okay, like this one, X is 2i, X is 2i. Okay, so you're going to use that one. Using X is 2i, you have 2y is 50, and 2 by 50 is 100. Okay. And hence, we have that X is 100. We've got the dimensions. Y is 50. Z is 100. Okay, you got that. X is 100. Y is 50. Z is 100. Therefore, the maximum value. Oh, okay. Therefore, the maximum volume is V. Okay, so it is X, Y, Z. X, Y, Z. So this maximum volume is going to be found by saying V, what is X? X is 100. What is Y? Y is 50. Z is 100. So you multiply everything here. 100 for X, Y is 50, which is in the middle, and then Z is 100. So that what we have here is 500,000 cubic centimeters. Okay, so the 500,000 500, cubic centimeters, okay, because this one is 500,000. The centimeter is, is times 10 to the minus 2 meters cubed. So it's going to be 500,000 centimeters divided by 100. So, but you cube it, it's going to be 10 to the sixth power cubic meters. So you divide by a million. Okay, divide 500,000 by a million is one half cubic meters. So you can write it as that 0 0.5 cubic meters. Ah. <laughs> right, so let's let's continue. Now you must also be in a position to do integration. Now, so far we've been looking at differentiation, but I want us to also look at paraboloids and integration. Question six is actually very interesting. Consider D to be the region below the paraboloid. So you have a paraboloid. We spoke about a paraboloid and there's something called a cylinder. And we shall just sketch these things. And, and there's a plane z equals one. Make sketch, make sketch of d and sketch the intersection of d with the exit plane for five marks. Let's sketch. Right, we've made enough space available for us to do sketching. Let us uh, sketch a little bit here in question 6.1. And then, okay, these are too many questions I planned today. So, yeah, it's. Um, but yeah, we're going to do the most we can. But now I want us to look at the fact that now we want to um, to sketch in A Roman figure one, we have Z. Ah, three plus. Okay, and then, okay, we're taking this one. So Z is this one. 
end. This is the case. Okay. Here you can write z minus 3 is x squared plus y squared. Okay, we transpose the minus 3 to the other side and we have like x squared plus y squared there. But we do not forget that the x squared plus y squared itself is 1 so that we can substitute it here and have z minus 3 equals 1. Right, and this means z equals 4. Okay, take note of that. Now, if z equals 4, what is what does this mean? Right, so, well, I mean, we are looking at the, by substituting one equation to the other, we are looking at the intersection of our paraboloid together with the cylinder. So at the point at which the paraboloid, like a parabola in three dimensions, meets a cylinder, it's, they meet at a circle. A cylinder is like a drum that is open at each, at each end, and, and therefore, if this paraboloid is open, the, this cylinder is going to cut this into a circular cross-section. Okay, now. Right. So, we anal analyze what that means. So at the point at which we have this, so it means therefore you'd have the following sketch. Right, so you have the following sketch. Z, Y, and x. Okay. Then there is a drum. Right, so this cylinder, this one, is uh, if you're here on the xy plane, it is a circle centered at the origin of radius one. But then obviously, you can look at it here, minus one, one minus one here. But now it's going to cut at z equals one. And then there's z equals one, and then there's also z equals four. Okay. One, four. And this is the case. We have that. And then this one is three. So we have this. Okay. So let us analyze this. Okay. This is going to be at one here. This is going to be at a four here, and this is going to be like three in the middle. Okay. Remember that inside the cylinder, this, so when we're considering, consider D to be the region below the paraboloid, the paraboloid is going to cut it four, Z equals four. So below the paraboloid, inside the cylinder, Above the plane z equals one, so the z equals one, but it's above. So you have between four and one, between z equals one and z equals four. You have the, but that part of the cylinder because this cylinder, this drum goes to infinity, goes up and goes down. So, but yeah, we're just interested in it between z equals one and z equals four. Okay, let's see what we have here. Okay, so make a sketch of D because D is the region we want. And sketch the intersection of D with the XZ plane. So the intersection with the 
XZ plane. So the XZ plane, if you are to slice these according to, this is the X and then Z, you slice it. So it's going to become this. It's going to become exactly this. Minus one, one. And then it's going to be like a vest. The paraboloid is going to make it uh, have that kind of shape. So these paraboloid, at the point that x is 0, y is 0 on the z-axis, you have 3 plus 0 squared plus 0 squared, which is only 3. So it's going to cut a 3 here. And this one is at 4 here. So in the end, then, right, so, okay. So this is the sort of cross section. So if you slice it, then this is gonna be, it's not, it's not, it, it is the, it is the, um, the cross section of the XZ plane. So this is Z. Zx plane, like that. This one is going down. Okay, so yeah, this becomes uh, the answer. So this one becomes the xz plane. Xz plane. Okay, so we have exactly that. Um. Um, um, right, we continue. Okay, right. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, we, we're done with this. Okay, we're just talking to another student. Okay, yeah, so this is exactly what we sort of have. It's the idea of what's happening here. Um, but just, just take note of the sketch. Okay, sketching is part of what you need, uh, sketching in three dimensions. Is very important. Make make okay. Express the volume of v of d in terms of a triple integral using the cylindrical coordinates to not evaluate the integral. Let's look at the second Roman figure. So we need to express now the volume of d in terms of triple integral using what we call cylindrical coordinates. Cylindrical coordinates are the x, y, z, um, and with r and theta, with r and theta, right? So, um, you confirm, you transfer. You change the x, y, z to r theta z. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, let us express this in terms of the... Um, now, I want to say first the volume. The volume of D in terms of in terms of triple triple integral using cylindrical cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so the volume of D using cylindrical coordinates, uh, we've already seen, therefore, that at this point, the radius is mostly, for instance, uh, here in the XY plane from 0 to 1. So R is from 0 to 1. Um, This thing here is the circle, uh, the cross-sectional view. It is it's circular. It has some circles at the, at the at each end of this of this um cylinder. Okay, but we're looking at it from z equals one to z equals four. Okay, but now um then the because it's a circle, a full circle in mathematics is a is, is a full revolution. So theta is from zero to two pi. Two pi is like three sixty degrees. That's a full revolution for a circle. Um, cross section of view at each end of the cylinder. Okay, now there's something called the the uh, the paraboloid. This one. 
this paraboloid now is between one z equals one z equals four we saw that okay but simultaneously there are things we need to remember that x squared plus y squared uh, in in the cylindrical coordinate system is r squared one less than that less or equal to x squared plus y squared okay x squared plus y squared plus three And this is actually now the x squared plus y squared. We said that x squared plus y squared is r squared. So we can put r squared plus three. Okay. So which means therefore now z is bigger than one because we're looking at that in, in the, um, we're able to then say now the volume of D. Okay. The volume of D is equal to the triple integral, zero to twice pi, zero to one. You'll understand this, please, now. Um, I'm just writing these things here, and then we shall elaborate on them. Right, so zero to one, and then one to r squared plus three. And if we want to find the volume of D, we put one, the number one. R D Z D R D theta. Theta being the angle, zero to two pi for a full circle, zero pi over two pi, three pi over two, then two pi radians. So if you go anti-clockwise like this, we actually have a full circle there for a cylinder. So the theta, which is on the outside here, runs from zero. To two pi. Okay. Now the radius, the radius of the circle x squared plus y squared is like a circle in two dimensions. Okay. In school we say it's a circle, but it's just that now when you go to three dimensions, we see that it 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 becomes a circle when you are on the x y plane. But now these things are extended upwards and they become vertical lines. These vertical lines trace a drum, which is formed by too many circles like this. And these circles now form what we call a cylinder. And then in the end, uh, the radius is therefore the, the radius of one, which is, uh, this is x squared plus y squared, x squared plus y squared is r squared, and the, the radius is one, okay, from high school. And then now the z. We've already seen that z is going to start from one. Z is going to start from one because Z is one. This is between Z one and four. Z is, is, is one uh, here. But now if you draw an arrow like this, Z then becomes Z equals three plus R squared. The X squared and Y squared, they become R squared. Because we use Pythagoras. So we move from Z equals one to Z equals uh, the three plus uh, R squared. Because the paraboloid now an arrow that is going to penetrate the region. It's going to meet this region at a, a section of the paraboloid, which is a parabola in three dimensions. But the parabola with, with x squared plus y squared is equals r squared means z is equal to 3 plus r squared. Okay, that's the thing. So um, so that is why this is going to start from the z in the cylindrical coordinate system. We are here to discuss these coordinate systems in detail, but we're starting from one to any part of the paraboloid, uh, looking at the um, at the x uh, x z plane. Right, so and this here is z is is z equals uh, is is z equal to paraboloid? Is z equals to the x squared plus y squared plus x squared? Uh, however, x squared plus y squared is r squared there. Okay, and this we don't need to evaluate. Um, so it is actually um the answer. Do not evaluate the integral. Just find it. Express the volume d in terms of the triple integral using cylindrical coordinates, which is the r theta z coordinate system. The R theta Z coordinate system is, is what you call the cylindrical coordinate system. All right. Yeah, we've discussed much for today. There are too many things I would like us to do. But on average, we've averaged our time so well. Um, we've covered nearly nearly two hours by just a minute. Um just that um I timed myself, but sometimes I I and this thing does not show me the time. But it's about two hours now. Okay. I have a lot still to do. I can talk the whole night. 
but time becomes a limiting factor. In, in, our next, in our next appearance, we'll continue with more things that we need to do. Uh, and I'm going to give you more information about the things that we need to do. Okay, right. So any question now? Um, my request would be that uh, next time yes. when we have a class, please let me know the topics that we are going to discuss. In advance. And, um, yeah. There are three topics that I... I do need like more, more practice or like more teaching on. Yes. Okay. Like, like the the proof of limit, it was, yeah, it will, you were too quick. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Okay, I'm going to notify you of the topics we're going to discuss so that you can, you know, let me know if it's ideal or we need to make changes or we need to focus on certain sections and not others, things like that.